hello everybody and good afternoon it's thursday it's 1 p.m it's one of my favorite times of the week so if you're watching us live settle in with your cuppa um, and let us entertain you for the next 30 minutes because we actually we were talking about this ladies weren't we we're thrilled to have such um and really humbled as well to have such a big list of guests waiting to come onto the show. And we love welcoming our guests onto the show and letting them sort of tell you all about themselves. And we're learning about different businesses and different mindsets and different personalities. So we absolutely love welcoming our guests onto the show. But we also love letting you in a little bit about our lives too. So I'm really thrilled today to be letting you into the world of the lovely lady in red, the gorgeous Kim Adele. That is one of our blondes. So I'm going to be um, bombarding Kim, or we're all going to be bombarding Kim with some questions later on, um, and I'm really excited to do that. But before I do, Blondes, what's been going on in your week? Caroline, how's your week been? Uh, very good, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just feeling that for coaches, there's a lot of opportunity out there. The world, the world needs coaches right now. So I'm getting a lot of inquiries. I know that, uh, the other coaches I know are saying it's pretty busy. And it's a, I feel very grateful and fortunate that my business has kind of been okay through all this. And in fact, coaches are in demand. People don't want what they have before. They want to make changes. They want the new year to bring something different. And I think what last year showed us is what we don't want anymore. And the great thing that coaches can do is help you find what you do want and get clarity. So I think people are really using 2021 to get that clarity now. So lovely, lovely, positive vibes, basically. Yeah, and you are smashing it, Caroline. You really are. Congratulations. Well <laughs> deserved you, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Penny, how's your week been? Yeah, it's been really good. Well, um, I'm, I'm pushing five working days into two because I've taken the first part of this week off to move my 93-year-old dad into out of our family home into a very beautiful flat, but it's a bit emotional. Won't go there. Um, but what I have learned, actually, um, during the night, listening to BBC when I couldn't sleep during this week, is that in July last year was the largest ever month for startups. Isn't that amazing? Mm. 80,000 startups in July Eight. last year. Which is really exciting, actually. I mean, gosh, doesn't that say a lot about the resilience of this country? And I know we're going to be talking about resilience. But today I was running a skills session for some of our Bit 100 members, and it was about program management. And we actually talked about the lean startup and how so many startups just dive in really fast and actually haven't done much planning and organizing and visualizing and thinking about it and probably haven't got themselves a coach. So I suppose that's what I'm thinking about today a lot is, you know, these startups and really honoring them, but also saying, calm yourself down and do some thinking time. Mm, yeah, mm. very good. Yeah, and I, I heard that statistic too, Penny, 80,000 startups. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I talk a lot, don't I, about the resilience and the grit of the SMEs, um, especially in good old Essex where I am. And and when I heard that statistic of 80,000 new businesses, I was like, good for you. You know, many, many people built their business in the last recession. Um, and this pandemic is going to throw out so many winners. And I'm so, so proud of them for doing that. So, yeah. So, Kim, I know we're going to come to you um, in abundance later, but. Um, so, so yeah. So, uh, firstly, apologies last week for not being here and, and ducking out. But I am now successfully on day eight of um, self-isolation with my little pickle, uh, who may well join us later so if we do end up with a baby Elsa um forgive me <laughs> but that is I guess life um and I think what it's really helped me realize is I was always I was already grateful for the life that I that I live and, and already really looking forward to being able to see people again and, and meet them but I think in this last week it's taught me all the other things that I appreciate that I had taken for granted like when you're you know, just a little bit tired and you think, well, I'll go out and get some fresh air and we'll go for a walk. Well, you're not allowed to do that if you're in self-isolation or you've ran out of yogurt and you go to the corner shop and you can't do that either. So it's made me realise how much of my life I was taking for granted that now I really appreciate. And I wonder how much 
more we get to be grateful for when we take the chance to be grateful for what we have. Oh, that's lovely, Kim. That's lovely. And, you know, we are going to talk about how resilient that you have been in your life in a minute. But again, another display of how you've adapted. You know, you never whinge, you never moan, like you're on your own with your daughter. It's day eight, but we've not heard a grumble from you. You've just got on and done it because that's that's you. And that's why we love you, our lady in red. Um but I echo what all of you ladies have said, actually, and what I've noticed in um, my peer groups this week is that the real community is coming out now. Um, and we saw this back in March, but not so much uh, lately. But I've seen it. I had a real goosebump moment yesterday um, during one of the peer groups when one guy was really busy trying to export. And he's like, I just I haven't got the labor I need at the minute because of furlough or, or not furlough because of isolation um, and I've got whole, my warehouse is ready to be packed and I need to ship it and one of the other ladies who owns um, a salon who unfortunately can't be open at the minute said do you know what I'm 20 minutes away from you I've got all the time in the world at the minute I'll come and help you I don't want paying and and it really did and it's, it makes me goosey now just saying it. these guys have just met a week ago and yet they're already you know willing to help out I love that SME spirit you know that real sense of we're in it together guys you know one's winning one's not but let's do it together mm -hmm. I love it mm. yeah really I think good. I think small business startups or solo entrepreneurs are the VIPs because they've made dreams a reality so you're in a kind of club of knowing the tough stuff and so you do want to help each other and I think it's fantastic that's mm. how we all grow the VIPs, I love that, Caroline. I love that. Yeah, so great week, I think. Great positive week coming from us four. Okay, so I said that we're going to get an insight into the, the gorgeous Kim Adele. Um, she is our blonde resident nerd, um, IT-wise, I have to say, IT-wise, because she just gets us out of trouble IT-wise all the time. But not only that, I mean, to everybody else, a renowned world-class leadership coach. She spent 25 years spanning a career in C-suite leadership. Um, and we know that, as I said, that she's had the most brilliant career, but also has had some, some hardships, which I'm hoping that Kim's going to share um, a little bit into us. So, Kim, my first question to you is, I mean, I've had the pleasure personally of getting to know you over the last two years. We met via um, Penny in her Mastermind programme, uh, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be doing this. So I'm hugely grateful for that. But we've spoken a lot in this show about your bravery um, in your past. And you inspire all of us ladies all the time with how quickly you adopt new tech, how quickly you take on new learnings and educate us into, have you heard about this, girls? Have you, are you trying this? And so we're always in awe of you, Kim, for that reason. But can you let the viewers in to some of how you've had to be a little bit resist uh, resilient and uh, against some sort of adversity yeah no absolutely and i think i don't know i think sometimes you, you we we're busy living our lives and we don't realize that they're anything other than ordinary so so you know i've always thought that my life is the most boring ordinary <laughs> um little journey um through life that you could ever have and it's only when you talk to other people that they're like really uh, and um all of that's happened and actually when you start to say it you're like actually it does sound a little bit made up I mean I have had three divorces a stalker three life-threatening illnesses a miscarriage a hurricane and two car accidents so you know I've kind of like chucked a fair bit um into my nearly 48 years but I do believe everything in life is either a lesson a blessing or both and at the time it might not feel like it at the time when you're in it you might it doesn't always feel like it's um, a lesson or a blessing but if you can look for what the lesson is then actually you grow from it and before you before you realize it you're out the other side and you know I have had those moments where I remember one particularly melodramatic moment where I was that upset I was that broken um, that I didn't know how to breathe which is clearly melodramatic and a little bit silly because I'm here now still breathing funnily enough still knew how to do it but that's how I felt at the time but I was really fortunate in that particular occasion, my little girl saved me because she was just shy of a year old when my marriage broke down and I was facing surgery and my whole world had exploded. Um, but I realized she needed me. 
So I couldn't break down. I couldn't give up. I couldn't fall over because she didn't ask to be born. I chose to have her. I chose to be her mum and she needed me. So you found a coping mechanism. Now, my particular coping mechanism is not one I'd recommend. I worked out that if I started crying at eight o'clock at night, as long as I finished at two o'clock in the morning, nobody would ever know because it was in between feeds and it was long enough to not look like you've been slapped with a wet fish in the morning when you woke up. So I did that for four months. Um, so for four months, every night we're like, yeah, eight o'clock, start crying. 2 a.m., stop crying, <laughs> get on with my day. Um, but before you before you realised it, you had got past the pain. You'd got past what was going on. You'd rebuilt your life and you kept going. Um, but I think, you know, with hindsight, a better coping mechanism would have been to share with people how I was feeling, to let people in. Because I have got amazing friends, amazing family, amazing people like you in my life who all wanted to be there for me. But I wasn't able at that point to let anybody in. I still needed to present this facade to the world that everything was okay because that almost not admitting it to people that cared for me meant I didn't have to admit it to myself. I would like to say Kim that um, I do advocate uh, a good wallow. <laughs> you know what not, not to be in denial of pain and sometimes you just have to put the Leonard Cohen on, have a glass of gin and wear your black and go and, and do, a, do a wind and wailing around the house like Kate Bush would be envious, you know, and, <laughs> and get it out because we're so stiff up and lips sometimes, but mm -hmm. most of all talk to someone as well. Yeah. You know, no. you, I, I think your coping mechanism was good. You allowed it out. And sometimes we just got to allow, allow. But really, to speak to someone is the key. But look at you. You're amazing. You've come through it. And what I love about Kim, there's no business. There's no, I've had, it, I've had it hard. You laugh at all your travails. You're really heroic and courageous for that. And I think that comes out of you. Bless you. Thank you. I, I totally agree. Well, moving on to your career, uh, Kim Adele. As I said, uh, amazing career in C-suite leadership over the last 25 years, but spanning lots of different roles over lots of different companies. So what role are you particularly most proud of? Um, oh God, so many, because they've all they've all been a different part of the a different part of the journey. Um, but I think actually the one I'm proudest of is the one that I hid from for the longest time. So I spent 25 years in corporate life hiding from the fact that I was a hairdresser. Um, and hoping that nobody ever found out, hoping that nobody turned around and went, oh, my God, we put the hairdresser on the board, get her off. And I spent so long thinking that that was my vulnerability. Um, and now I realise it was my superpower. What I learned as a hairdresser, which was to listen to people, to understand them, to try and define what it, uh, what their dream is and then help them make it a reality, has basically been what carried me through becoming a leader myself and becoming a running my own business now and being a leadership coach because at our simplest, irrelevant of our age, our gender, our uh, religious beliefs, anything, we all want to be listened to, we want to be understood and we want to be respected. And that doesn't mean to say we can't disagree, but we can disagree but not disrespect. And I think once you get to that, once you realise that everybody wants to be listened to, understood and respected and you hold that space for them, then life becomes an amazing journey. And I think... I'm so proud now that I got the opportunity to learn that so young as, as a hairdresser. It's interesting, isn't it? Because when you were talking earlier about adversity, that um, resilience muscle grows, doesn't it? The more you you went through. And and then you get to a point, it sounds like you got to a point when you started to realise that all those journeys have made you who you are. And whilst you maybe for a while were defined by things that you felt were awful, you're now becoming defined by all the great things in that. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, how you, and it, it's like almost um, life only makes sense in the rear view mirror. So it only makes sense when you look back at it, because when you're in it, you're too much in the emotion, you're too much in it, how it feels, um, that actually it's only when you look back, when you look backwards and the emotions turn down a little bit that you can really see what's going on. And I think I spent the last year, probably 18 months has been a massive journey for me, as you guys know, because you've been on it with me. So thank you. Um, but in having to go back and look at my life and 
reassess how I viewed it, reassess what I what I was taking from it. And also for the first time, appreciate myself. Because I, you know, I think it was probably 18 months ago, I remember having to go and do something where you had to look in the mirror and say three things you appreciated about yourself. And it was the most uncomfortable 15 minutes of my life because I couldn't come up with a thing, not one. And everything that I came up with was like, well, I'm Scarlett's mum. It's like, that's not about you. Uh, I've got great friends. That's not about you. And um, it was awful. I literally couldn't do it. Um, I, and I suddenly looked at him and was like, if I can't do it, then I'm teaching Scarlett to not do it. Um, and I can't live with that. I can't live with being the person that teaches her to have the same evil inner critic that I've lived with myself. And therefore, I've had to go and do the work to get over my evil inner critic, to be able to put those things out there and say, you know, I would never in a million years say these things to another human being. Never. Um, because they're awful and they're evil and they're cruel. And yet I happily said them to myself for 40 odd years and actually now talking to clients and talking to friends. So many of us do. So many of us do talk to ourselves in language that we would never, ever dream of using on somebody else. And so I guess for me, my, my lesson has been to treat myself the way I treat other people. And that's still a learning curve for me. Um, and I still get it wrong all of the time. Um, but I now ask myself, if this were somebody else, what would you say to them? If this were one of you ladies, if this were Scarlett, if this were somebody on the street, what would you say to them? and say that to yourself and it's it makes a massive difference but it's really hard to do when you've been using the other language on yourself for so many years when you're working with leadership with the subject of leadership helping leaders what are the common things that you see are holding them back from being the amazing leaders they could be um for me one of the biggest challenges is they, they are looking inward on what they need um, so they're thinking about what is it I need as a leader to be able to be successful. Whereas for me, I've always been a big believer that as a leader, my my job is to deliver the right service to my people. Because if I'm delivering what they need to thrive, then they'll want to continue to work for me because they're getting something good out of it. So instead of thinking, what do I need? I, I instead focus on what do they need? And actually, that's probably one of the biggest lessons that I'm helping other leaders with which is to determine for them, what is it your people need to be able to thrive? Because when your people are thriving, they will deliver the service your clients need and therefore your clients will be thriving. And I guarantee at that point, your business will be thriving. But it's, it's changing that focus away from what do I need to what can I give? Um, and I think that for me is the, the next challenge for leaders is to move into that space of actually your role is to deliver service, not to receive service. And talking about changing of leadership styles, I'm personally, and I'm interested to know what you think about this, but personally, I think that when we get back into normal business life, whatever that is and whatever that is, I think there's going to require a huge leadership shift. Do you think? Yeah, massively. So, I mean, the World Economic Forum had a report out in 2018, which talked about the skills that are required by 2022 and beyond to lead effectively. And a large part of that is leading with emotional intelligence, with social influence and with engagement, because we're moving into an ever increasing age of digitalization and automation. And therefore, the ability to be able to engage and empower and enthuse people is going to become our most significant skill. And it's one that's not necessarily been that important for a lot of years. You know, we've we've made ourselves successful based on our IQ not on our EQ. And actually now what's going to help us remain relevant is going to be our ability to engage with people. And that's a muscle that many haven't had to flex for a long time. But the other scary statistic is that 57% of people leave their boss, not the organisation. So if you're a leader and you think about the people that have left, more than one in two of them have left you. And if that isn't a wake up call to say, I might need to think differently about how I am, moving forward I'm not really sure what it is um, because we need to we need to evolve to remain relevant to the new generations what they're you know what they're expecting from their leaders is very different to what we were willing to tolerate when we were being led I think you're right so sorry Caroline I think not only have we got the the pandemic and different leadership styles that's going to bring with remote working and 
you know, maybe a leaner team, less capacity, you know, less efficiency maybe. I think we've also got the millennials coming in. So that was always going to cause a shift. So we've got like a double bubble of shift coming, haven't we? Yeah, hugely. And actually, if we think about it, you know, we're, we're going to have yet another change because we've got the generation behind the millennials and they'll want something different as well. And I guess it's life in general is all about evolving, isn't it? It's about continuing to reinvent ourselves. And, you know, if you think about the pop stars that have remained really uh, relevant throughout the last you know, four or five decades, it's because they've looked at what's going on around and they've adapted and they've reinvented themselves to become relevant to the new generation. And I think that's kind of what we need to do as, as leaders is realise that, you know, a bit like fashion and everything else, it's all cyclical. It'll all keep coming back round, but it comes round slightly differently. Um, and therefore, it's how do you take the skills you've already got and turn the volume upon them? And how do you gain additional skills that are going to continue to keep you relevant both to the marketplace, to your clients and to your colleagues. And I think once we can do that, once we put colleagues back on the agenda, then it becomes a much nicer place for people. Um, and it's, I suppose for me, it's about how do we get people to lead with kindness, humanity and courage? Because often we talk about kindness, but you've got to have the courage to make the difficult decisions as well. Sometimes you have to downsize an organisation or we have to cut costs and we have to... Um, cut people's jobs and that's heartbreaking I, I know I've had to do it um but it's about doing it with courage and kindness so making the decision because it's the right thing to retain as many jobs as you can but then being kind to the people that are being impacted and hold their hand throughout the the journey so that they realize it's not them they you know they're not being made redundant because they're not good at what they do because they're not amazing people because you wouldn't love to have them work for you they're being made redundant because the reality is you couldn't lead them to a different place. But if you can do it with kindness so that they realise that actually they're great people, they are employable, you would love to have them back with you at the point you grow, then you can do it without causing damage to people. And I think that's what we're all here to do is to learn how to lead people in the most effective way for them and for us so that we leave people unharmed. It's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of what we talk about here is take is personal responsibility and talk about culture and leadership. My first job when I was 19, I loved it so much doing telesales for an IT company. I loved the culture so much. That I remember thinking this company had a problem. I would actually work for them for free for a while to get them through. And I do think that we look at leaders and their responsibility. There's also the upward responsibility each person has in an organisation to be committed to the organisation isn't there and so sometimes I think they I talk we all talk to leaders sometimes there's and I know I'm showing the opposite side of a coin here but sometimes there seems to be an entitlement of individuals and not taking responsibility for the place that they're working in as well and their attitude towards it and I suppose that's all part of a leader's role as well isn't it to help them yes. feel that and help them realize they've got a part to play so you know I always mm. talk to people and say you know I think as, as a leader my role is to set the scenery. So to say, you know, we're going to Edinburgh. I don't know how we're going to get there, but we're going to Edinburgh. And that's where we're going. Actually, what I want you guys to do is help me decide how do we get there? Because it's a little bit like if you were directing a play and you or a film and you've just put, you've just cast Helen Mirren, you're not going to micromanage uh, to tell her how you want her to bring the character to life. You're going to go, do you know what, you're Helen Mirren. <laughs> like, we would just like you to bring this character to life however you see fit. And I think that's true of our people. If we can tell them, you know, this is the this is the film in which we're in and this is the character I want you to play, but now play it however you want to play it. Play it to the best of your ability. Bring your whole self to that role. Then actually that is the times when you've got those companies where you go, I would work for you for nothing because I'm committed to you because actually you were committed to me. You were, you were confident enough in who I was that you were willing to let me bring that role to life however I saw fit rather than micromanage me into doing it your way because that's when we're going to learn more and I think you know Steve Jobs um, talked about it a lot but I think that was one of the great things he did in his leadership style was he encouraged people to be better than he was to be brighter than he was to be more intelligent um, and to come up with the answers because he was confident enough that actually collectively you were going to be stronger and that's a really hard thing to do and we know you know particularly in the environments we've all been operating in where 
you worry, don't you? If like, if I lose my job, if somebody else is going to come and take it, am I going to be good enough? But actually having the confidence to say, I'm not good at this and I'm going to recruit somebody who's better than me at that is going to be the thing that keeps you employed for life because the organization will realize that actually the organization's goal was more important than your personal agenda. And who wouldn't want people like that working for them? Um, I'm sure we all would in our organizations. But it, again, it's a huge leap of faith. And, and I think we've got to be, as, as leaders, you've got to get the right support around you because it's lonely at the top, but it's certainly not quiet because you've got everybody coming to you wanting information. So they want in direction. And where do you go to get your support? And it's okay to need support. We all do. So I think for, for me, that's probably that's kind of why I do what I do now for a living, which is provide people with that safe space, with that support, that time almost to be able to cut through the noise and have some thinking time. But sometimes you need to do that thinking with somebody else, don't you? You need to be able to hear the words out loud because sometimes you say them out loud and you're like, oh, my God, that's ridiculous. <laughs> why have I even thought that? And yet I've been saying it in my head for days and believing it to be true. I think every organisation needs a Kim Adele because um, there's some institutional ways of leading which have been the old school. And so some of it's ego based. It's a little bit macho for men and women, the sort of power trip of the leader. And this EQ that you're bringing in is long overdue. But it's not something you can just tell people to do. As you say, you've got to work on the leaders so that they truly get it. It's not about ruling by fear or power or ego or one upmanship. It's about engagement and enrollment and helping them see that they're not letting go of something. They're gaining something from this. Yeah, it takes a confident leader to be that person, though, doesn't it? So yeah. it's much if you're not confident, you tend to be that control freak, that autocrat, that yeah. don't be so the confident yeah. leader. And that's why I think you know people need to get that support because being a leader is a really hard job. Um, because you're having to lead yourself through whatever's going on at the same time as having to lead your people. And we don't often share that. We don't often say, you know, it's hard to be a leader, but it is. It's tough. Um, and that's why you kind of have to sometimes say, Do you know, what? I just need a little bit of help. And there's no shame in asking for help um, because we're always stronger together. It's always nice to know you've got somebody on, on your side. It's great when you've got people like you guys. I can pick up the phone to and come. I've had a really rough day today and I could just do with sounding this out um, to just get a different perspective because all of a sudden you'll see something you couldn't see before when you're just locking it in on yourself. So, Kim, I want to let everyone into a little secret. I hope you don't mind me sharing, but you are writing a book. I am indeed. Um, so, What I inspired am... you, Kim, to do it? What inspired you? It, what inspired me was actually I, I shared a little bit of my journey and people were like, oh, my goodness, like we always assumed that nothing had ever gone wrong in your life because you always look so happy and so bubbly. Um, and I was like, well, actually, I, I guess, you know, hairdresser to CEO is – the expectation is that that was a, a relatively easy journey but as we mentioned at the start you know there's been a few other things along the way so my book is called um and forgive the swearing uh, you couldn't make this shit up three divorces a stalker and an evil inner critic and it basically is just sharing the lessons i've learned in my 48 years so far um that have helped me get through that on the hope that if it helps just one person deal with whatever is in their life right now that they're struggling with then it's worth the embarrassment of sharing just how many disasters I managed to cram into my 48 years well I love that because we've all had disasters we've all had vulnerabilities we've all got vulnerabilities and you're just willing to lay it all out there for everybody to read and you know once again that's just a sign of your bravery but Kim, well, we love having you as our friend, as our resident blonde. Um, and I've loved letting everybody else into a little bit of you today because there is so much of you um, and we could talk all day long. Um, but thank you for being so honest and for sharing. Um, and before we go, ladies, let's, as always, just finish with our tip. Um, Carol Ann, your tip of the week, please. Oh, you're on mute. on there's always someone isn't there uh, I was going to say my simple question for all business owners to ask themselves right here right now is what hope are you giving your clients I love that love that, love that. Kim Adele 
Um, how do you follow that? Um, so I would say the advice I would I would give people is find your support network and trust them. So open up and, and share how you're feeling uh, because you can deliver as much for them as they can deliver for you. Lovely. Pen. Uh, very quickly, uh, just take some time out to do some thinking time about your business. I think that's going to be really important. A lot of people are accelerating at the moment, but just take some time out to think. And for me, check in on your community. Like I said before, is there somebody that needs your help and you can lend them a little bit of your time? That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. So, Kim, how do people get in touch with us? Absolutely. So if you want to be uh, on here with us sharing your story, please get in touch at www.businessblondes.tv. And we would love to hear from you. And thanks all for watching. And we will see you next week. Have a good one.